Welcome everybody to the British Foreign Policy Group. Uh, my name is Sophia Gaston. I'm the director here. Uh, this is a series of conversations that we're having with uh, people around the world who have really interesting purviews about how the coronavirus pandemic is playing out where they are. Um, it's a real pleasure today to be hosting Boyan Panchevsky. He's the uh, Berlin and German correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, knows a lot about the British context as well. He used to work for the Sunday Times. Uh, so we're delighted to have him here today to talk about Germany's response um, and maybe, maybe the broader European picture as well. So just to kick things off, um, I just want to get a sense of what you see as the kind of the lay of the land in terms of the way in which Germany came into this crisis. Um, there has been this sense that Germany has outperformed a lot of other EU nations. And certainly here in Britain, there is this constant narrative of why can't we be doing what Germany is doing? What kind of natural advantages did they have in terms of the structure of, of their kind of federal state, um, any kind of diagnostic capacities and so on that has helped them to be in this position? Or is it really just about kind of good political choices? Well, I think it's much less about governance and policy uh, than about sort of, as you said, structural advantage. Germany ha has a huge diagnostic industry, and this is just a legacy of uh, private sector development and policy going back decades. So essentially, as they entered this crisis, this unexpected crisis, which caught them off guard like everyone else, uh, they basically had about 170 labs and I, probably more, we can't, they have so many labs that we don't even know how many, but uh, I think the, the sort of official figure is 170 labs able to do coronavirus testing, and most of them are pretty much doing that around the clock as we speak. So the potential, what they call the theoretical capacity for testing is 750,000 tests a week now, and that's going up, you know. They started with 35,000 on, on the first week of the crisis, and now they're up to 750 or 30,000 a week. So that's, that's a massive number in comparison, of course, compared to other European countries. And they've just had this capacity lying around. They could take advantage of it. They could fall back on this enormous sort of laboratory network. Many of these labs are private. Some of them are sort of state funded. Most of them are private, I think. So then the second thing is they've got an enormous number of hospitals. They've got an enormous number uh, of, of uh, intensive care units. I think per capita, they have the highest uh, number of intensive care unit beds in, uh, in Europe, I think. It's certainly in the European Union, definitely. And, and in the OECD, they're number two, I believe, or number three. Um, so that, that is also a huge capacity and a huge asset. So essentially, that means that nobody even if the pressure were much greater than it actually is, there would be hardly any patients left without a ventilator, uh, without a some sort of breathing aid, without intensive care uh, unit care. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a huge advantage and that's not a result of policy, anyway, not a result of any recent policy, but that's a legacy going back decades of many governments. So that's in a nutshell, uh, you know, that's, Part of the part of the secret of, of Germany's success in, de in dealing with this, essentially German hospitals, unlike French hospitals, unlike the NHS, unlike Spanish or Italian hospitals, are sort of empty of critical patients. Now, why that is, it's of course the the, the capacity plays a role. If you have, as they do now, almost forty thousand beds in intensive care units, you know it's difficult to fill them up. But the actual you know thing here is that. German patients do not get criti critically ill to the extent that, uh, you know, they fill the hospitals. So why that is, we don't actually know. So that's also not a result of policy. You know, it's too early to praise Chancellor Merkel or anyone for having done something right, because essentially what we are dealing with here is we have, I think, around 140,000 registered uh, infections in Germany now. That's the official figure. And, uh, and not many people are in critical care. Um, whereas in France and, and Britain, we have plenty of people clogging the hospital system and from early on. Whereas in Germany, that has been a gradual raise. I think the, one of the reasons I reported on this, one of the reasons is because people, uh, you know, the average age of the patients here is, is quite young. They started, you know, weeks ago, it was 45. 
that's quite young. And obviously we know that younger people are, are, are not really falling severely ill with this particular disease. Uh, to compare in Italy, the average age at that time was about 67. So you see the difference, you know, if you're 67, obviously you're going to have more side effects from therapy or, or just get severely ill anyway. So I think they've been lucky as in a nutshell, you know, they've had this huge capacity, number one, they had this huge number of beds, number two, and number three, and perhaps most important, uh, you know, their average age of patients is, is very low. Even now, as we speak, it's 50 years of age, the average. So I think the reason for that is because the initial outbreak happened among a cohort of very young and fit people that was skiers coming back from Italy and Austria. And it was schools and kindergartens who had been on holidays in, um, in Italy, in Northern Italy, which was the epicenter of the outbreak at the time. So when the disease started spreading, it started spreading among children, among teenagers, among young and fit people who go skiing. And that was really in a nutshell, the, the asset of Germany. Interesting. So obviously being in this kind of privileged position has allowed them to start thinking about a transition and the kind of exit strategy out of this first phase of the crisis. Um, how is that being structured? Um, how does that sort of differ from some of the other plans that we're hearing from places like Austria and so on? Or is it all sort of very similar pathways and how is it being received i mean we've heard a lot this week about the schools in denmark and this huge mm. backlash from parents um, who are actually terrified to send their children to these schools how is it going down in germany in germany is a bit different you see because they were spared from the onset and they are still spared of the, you know the magnitude of the crisis you have to understand in germany is is as a totally different scale than elsewhere you know obviously people in britain or in spain or in france are much more worried because they are seeing they probably they know they have loved ones they have friends who've been taken to hospital they see the hospitals being overwhelmed and sort of the public sentiment is different here in germany we've not really had a crisis you know so essentially, a lot of people are questioning the wisdom of the lockdown in the first place because they don't see a reason for it. What they see is television reports from Italy or Spain or the New York now of these horrible scenes playing out in hospital corridors. But we haven't seen to them. It's like something far away in a distant land. So a lot of people, I think, are questioning the lockdown and are quite eager to sort of restart the economy, send their kids back to school and go back to work. So that's, the, I think the prevalent sentiment is that, of course, you have the other coin, side of the coin where people are actually concerned and listening to the scientific advice. And that scientific advice is that we're not out of the woods yet, that Germany is in fact at the beginning of this epidemic, like every other country, and that there will be probably another peak, there will be probably another outbreak. And as soon as, soon as you loosen the, the restrictions, that the virus will, will begin to spread. Uh, as far as schools are concerned, Germany decided it's a federal system. So the federal government of Chancellor Merkel gives recommendations to the 16 states, which have autonomy in deciding on, on healthcare policy, on schools, on many things. So essentially the recommendation since this week is to start opening schools in May, in the first week of May, starting with older um, students, basically teenagers, because the, the idea is that teenagers will be able to follow the advice on social distancing and increase hygiene measures. So they will start with older students and then and then and then go down to the to the younger ones. Uh, it will be a gradual thing. Um, Austria, which is sort of leading the way in terms of policy, they went into lockdown earlier and they're leaving earlier as well has decided not to open the schools. That's interesting. And because Austrian officials are saying the moment you open the schools, they become incubators of the disease and uh, the epidemic will start spreading. And we're not interested in doing that. In Germany, however, uh, you know, I think partly because of the pressure uh, on politicians, because constituents are not really feeling the pressure as I, as I, as I earlier explained, I think they were forced into opening the schools, but then it's a patchwork. Uh, the state of Bavaria, for example, is very reluctant to, to even open the schools. Uh, the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, which is the most popular state, is sort of pressing ahead. So you have a patch, patchwork of policy, as, as always, and we'll see how it ends. But I think, uh, I think there, there are warnings that the moment you, you, you lift the restrictions, the virus will continue to circulate. And I don't think there's a very clear answer to the question, what do you do then? 
In Austria, the answer to that question is that everyone should wear a mask in public, i.e. if they are going shopping or they're using the public transport, they will have to, it's mandatory to wear a face mask. And the government recommends employers impose this rule in workplaces as well. So we, we expect to see that people working in office buildings will be wearing masks during working hours as well. So that's one policy. In Germany, we don't have that policy, except on local level in the city of Jena, for example, in former Eastern Germany, they imposed this policy of uh, uh, mandatory wearing of masks. And interestingly, since they did that, I, I think a couple of weeks ago, they haven't had a single new infection. So that's perhaps the way forward, but there's no agreement on the federal level. Interesting. And I think one of the most fascinating aspects about uh, this crisis and about the lockdown is the way in which governments approach the lockdown and then the behavior of citizens, you know, it tells us so much about the social fabric of those nations and they're all incredibly different. I mean, here in Britain, there was this sense that, um, you know, we obviously have a prime minister who very much values individual liberties. And I think there was a lot of concern that perhaps Brits would be too freedom loving um, to adhere to a lockdown when actually the adherence has been incredibly, incredibly high, much higher than they ever expected. Mm. How has Germany kind of socially responded to this? Have they, has it revealed anything about the German character? Well, that's an interesting question. I think, yeah, there, there, there was a lot of coverage here in Germany of, of what Britain was doing. Initially, there was talk about this herd immunity approach, then, you know, there were all these reports about the government receiving, the British government receiving advice from behavioral scientists that basically Brits are an unruly mob and they will not, you know, adhere to any rules after a couple of days or weeks. And that proved to be wrong. In Germany, certainly it does seem like people are following the guidelines. I think we've seen that on the basis of mobile phone data and other sort of indicators that people just sort of uh, obey the rules. And I think as a nation, Germans, the stereotype goes that they are rule obeying people. And I think they they took it seriously because Chancellor Merkel came out, albeit late, but she did come out and explain the dangers of this. She said that eventually 60, 70% of people will get infected and that process needs to slow down drastically if hospitals are not to be clogged and if we're not to see scenes like those in Italy. So people sort of understood the gravity of the situation. And I think they, uh, you know, they followed the rules. I mean, talking about national character, we see the same happening in Nordic countries. For example, Sweden does not even have a lockdown, but basically the government recommended that people should stay at home. However, restaurants are open, you know, bars are open, people are able to do things that are, you know, people in Germany and Britain are not no longer able to because there is a lockdown. And Swedes are still, you know, most of them, I guess, according to the to the studies I've seen, are actually adhering to the the, the, the voluntary guidelines. And, you know, obviously the same thing across uh, Scandinavia. So I think you do see the national character come out. I mean, there were a lot of reports that Italians are not actually strictly uh, following the rules of their lockdown, which which was much stricter and, and, is, is, and is therefore, you know, lasting much longer. Thing. We, we saw the same thing in Austria. Austria had a very strict lockdown uh, and for about a month or so, and now they're able to exit. Actually, on Tuesday, they lifted much of the, many of the restrictions and uh, life returns to normal. So I think we, 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 we do see that, you know, different nations react differently to government advice. However, with the caveat, I have to say I live in London, um, in, in Berlin, obviously, which is the capital of uh, depravity. And I didn't get a sense that we were in a lockdown at all. People, uh, people still move around. You know, bars are closed, but they sort of congregate in parks and they, you know, smoke joints and take drugs and drink and whatever. So in Berlin, you didn't really feel that there was much of a lockdown. But nevertheless, it seems to be working. Whatever lockdown there is in, in place, it seems to have slowed down the infection. So let's just turn to the political dimensions of this because this is what's so fascinating. We we are seeing a sort of rallying around the flag in a lot of places. Um, approval ratings for leaders seem to be up. Um, people are very much focused on the leader, um, whomever is in government and putting a lot of trust in them for now. Don't know how resilient that is going to be. Um, and certainly I would see a huge degree of potential uh, grist to the mill for, for different types of anti-establishment and populist parties on the other side of this. But in the German situation, you obviously had Chancellor Merkel and her party in quite a bit of strife for some years now, and her plan for succession had sort of been very disrupted. 
Um, where do you see Merkel coming out from this on the other side? Who's performed well? Who could be some potential um, other candidates for, for the party leadership if Merkel does still um, want to step down? And just finally on the IFD um, and the Greens, which had been the kind of two most prominent insurgent parties um, over the past five years, how have they been um, performing during this crisis? Well, that's a very interesting question. It's sort of difficult to answer all the different layers of that question because we don't, we actually don't know how this will end. And I think much, much, much of the outcome, the political outcome depends on how the epidemic evolves. So for the time being, people are rallying behind the flag. The, the, the approval rates of the chancellor are skyrocketing. I mean, they always have been high, even in the worst of crisis. But now she's sort of totally undisputed. She's seen as a great crisis manager. She's seen as a sort of a rock of calm and stability in a sea of uh, uncertainty. Her party is approaching the 40% mark, which is huge. I mean, they dropped to 24, 25% a couple of months ago before the epidemic. So uh, they seem to regain all the losses and then gain some. I mean, um, it seems like they're they're going they're approaching the next election uh, with with great strength and 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 sort of a reservoir of public support, which is to be expected in the crisis. Um, the resurgent parties, the 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 alternative for Germany and the Greens. It's difficult to compare them because the, the, the alternative for Germany is a new party. It's, you know, it's about six years old, whereas the Greens are a sort of establishment party now. They were set up in the, the 70s and uh, in the 80s. Uh, however, both of them seem to have appealed to a segment of, of the population, which in, in time, in, 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 you know, in fair weather times, was able to sort of focus on some sort of luxury items of politics, you know, uh, and in crisis, all of that is stripped away uh, from people's thinking. You know, the Greens stand for climate, they stand for political correctness, they stand for social justice, they stand for kindness to mi migrants and, and vulnerable groups. The IFD perhaps stands for, <laughs> for the opposite of all of these things that I just said, and, and it stands for sort of a return to a more uh, a national uh, to a national pride to to you know uh, restricting migration all these issues which are now at the moment simply not relevant because people are thinking about survival thinking people are thinking about the survival of the economy and, and we are facing a, a huge economic downturn at a global scale the imf said the other day it's going to be worse than or equal to the great depression so essentially people are worried, people are scared, and then they, they turn to, to a safe pair of hands, uh, Miss Merkel, obviously, and the CDU and the establishment party that you know, have been around. They have managed crisis before, the crisis of 2008, 2009, the Euro crisis of 2011, 2012. So I think in, in times of crisis, the, the luxury items become less important and therefore both the Greens and the IFT, the Alternative for Germany, have lost a lot in the polls. And these losses are now sort of moving towards the establishment as it used to be before, before this sort of upset begun. And I think it's sort of really started in 2015 with the migration crisis. So we are seeing a sort of a readjustment to the good old days. Uh, whether that will last is difficult to say because if the epidemic, if the pandemic takes an ugly turn and there is a second spike in deaths in hospitalizations, if, if the economic crisis really blows up, there's no telling what could happen, obviously. I mean, the IFD could profit from, from it eventually down the road, but it's, it's really difficult to predict. And particularly because there is this element of us having you know, all of us having closed up borders um, and exerted a degree of control that has been positioned as incompatible with the EU project. I mean, how do you see this kind of ongoing debate uh, about border control and freedom of movement of people and particularly freedom of movement uh, for, for non-EU citizens, how do you see that playing out in the aftermath of that? Because certainly you can imagine people like Matteo Salvini um, wanting to come out on the other side and saying, well, all the things you said were impossible, we've now shown mm -hmm. what we can do. Well, I think that's certainly a great possibility. It will vary from country to country because Italy was badly hit. There is a perception in Italy that the EU has not helped them, that being part of the EU has not been of any benefit to them. I mean, polls are showing this. There is a, there is a subjective percep perception among 
that the EU has failed to protect them, has failed to help them. So I think in Italy, this will be a huge issue. You're quite right to say that. In Germany, it will be a little bit different, but again, depending on the outcome. But however, you know, as you said, a lot of policy, holy policy cows have been slaughtered in this crisis. I mean, we've been told time and again that the Schengen borders are sacrosanct, that if you sort of stop the free movement of people, you know, the sky will fall on our heads. Uh, all sorts of things have been said down uh, the years. You know, Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the, the previous president of the commission was very forcefully sort of warning people of the economic damage that uh, obstructing the free movement of people would inflict on our economies. Now we're seeing a situation where the borders are sealed. That, you know, I, as a journalist, have difficulties traveling around doing my job. Uh, however, goods are flowing freely still. You know, the, the, the transfer of goods has not been uh, obstructed. And I think the populace of this world will be able to cite this example in future debates about migration of how you can actually successfully close the borders even to your own citizens in a crisis and then they can observe whether there is an economic damage or not and whether society can actually deal with more border control perhaps more migration control so all of these debates will, will come back to haunt us because essentially i think in this crisis we're proving that certain things that were said to be impossible are in fact not only possible but entirely feasible you know uh, even, you know, going across the border policy, uh, talking about fiscal measures, you know, Germany has, the German government has telling people that borrowing is sin and that what they call the black zero, i.e. a balanced budget, is basically uh, ordained by God and has to be a state of permanent sort of, now it's not the case. They, they've borrowed 156 billion from the markets. They, you know, they, they've done things they've said are impossible to do and they're in fact, not impossible. In Spain, we're seeing the introduction of uh, um, of uh, income for everyone. Uh, what you call that? God, my, my brain stopped. Um, universal basic income. Yeah, exactly. Universal basic income, uh, which which has been the butt jokes among among most conservative economists and and people in government. And now we're seeing it enacted in practice. I mean, in fact, for that matter, we're seeing sort of fiscal conservatives in the Republican Party saying that universal basic income is the way forward in order to prevent uh, sort of an apocalyptic scenario uh, for the economy and, and for jobs, because jobs are going to be lost and they, they are already disappearing. So we're, we're seeing the, you know, the central banks, uh, the monetary policy is, is looser than ever. The fiscal policy becomes looser than ever, even in, in the bastions of, of, of orthodoxy, such as Berlin, or the Hague in the Netherlands. So I think policies are pended across the board and, and the fact that the borders have remained closed but, but trading continues, the flow of goods continues, industry continues at pace. You know, despite the lockdown, about 80% of, uh, of Germany's industrial capacity is up and running. You know, they never stopped the factories from running. They never cut the supply chain. The supply chains are working. In Austria, it's the same thing. Austria never shut down the factories. They only limited the freedom of movement. So once you see that that's possible, I think people like uh, Mr. Salvini in Italy will certainly take advantage of it in their future political endeavors. I mean, I'm sure you've seen uh, Macron's kind of bombshell interview uh, with the Financial Times where he has essentially said, you know, we need to be honest, this is a political mm. project, it's not just an economic project. Um, and I think you're quite rightly diagnosed that the EU hadn't particularly performed well on yet another test of solidarity during a time of crisis. So I'm interested how, in how that's been received in Germany. Obviously, it's a kind of provocation, but um, I'm also interested in your views about what would happen if the EU, which is already struggling to deal with this crisis, faces another crisis, because I think we seem to have forgotten that just, you know, in the weeks before the pandemic took hold, we had another kind of potential migration crisis on our hand with the collapse of this um, agreement with Tur between Turkey and the European Union. There were migrants sort of storming the Greek border. Um, we know that with this pandemic, it, it, if it does take hold in Africa or the Middle East, we could very quickly see another kind of pressure point uh, building on the borders. Um, do you think that uh, any work is really being done to think about 
how to deal with this kind of issue because it does seem to be an ongoing it's not just a kind of mm -hmm. sporadic crisis it's actually a kind of business as usual crisis for the european yeah. union um and how do you think that a migration crisis in the post-COVID landscape might play out. I mean, we, the 2015-16 migration crisis came at a very particular time. If that sort of kind of crisis emerged again at this point, with everything that we've been through in the European Union since then, um, how do you think it might play out differently now? Well, that's a pile of uh, very interesting questions. Um, Listen, I think, I think uh, you're quite right. I mean, the European Union has been sort of uh, existing uh, with multiple crises just piling up on each other. And, and every, every couple of years, we add another existential crisis to the burden. And I think what, what we've learned since, since this sort of crisis mode escalated, which I think is in 2009, really, with, with, the, with the great, after the fall of uh, Lehman Brothers, um, ever since we've just been adding crisis to crisis. And I, I think, you know, it, what's been proven is that the European Union is basically a single market. It's, 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 it's been constructed to deal with trade. It's been constructed to deal with rules about state aid, about competition, about things like that. It's not being constructed to deal with migratory pressures. It's not being constructed to deal with pandemics. Is not being constructed to deal with wars with 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 uh, with America becoming hostile, you know. Uh, so you know, it's not being constructed for a bipolar world where China and America are fighting it out, and 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 Britain uh, and and Europe is becoming the battleground of that. So none of these functions ha are in the DNA of the Union. And of course, I think to upgrade it to a level where it would be a nimble uh, agent of delivering uh, policy that could deal with all this stuff is 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 I think not really realistic essentially so they have to model true in, in terms of whether some thinking is being done I doubt it I mean I'm sure people are thinking in in, in the in the obscure corners of, of ministries and agencies and whatnot but in my experience uh, politicians can deal with the issue at hand if that so I think they don't have the bandwidth they don't have the headspace to to uh, you know deal with multiple issues at a time the pandemic is here and that's what they're doing um, in fact, uh, Chancellor Merkel was late in sort of starting to take charge of the pandemic contingency because she was dealing with, with President Erdogan of Turkey because of the, of the looming migration crisis. I think obviously to her as a politician and to her government, a, a, a migration crisis that could hit Germany again is one of the worst scenarios imagined because of what happened in 2015 and 2016. So she kind of wasted a couple of weeks of uh, dealing with Erdogan before sort of becoming involved in the crisis management of the pandemic. So that, that tells you how important it is to her. But obviously now she's managing the pandemic, so she can't be doing the same thing. And we've sort of forgotten about the, the looming migration crisis, which, as you see, will be, become incredibly amplified at the end of this pandemic because these countries will be left poorer. They will be probably damaged severely. Um, they don't have the capacity to deal with the, the deal with this problem, and I think you know crisis increases migration. That's as simple as that. So we will have to face this in the future, and then I think uh, we don't we don't really have a policy. You know, five years later, five years after 2015, uh, Europe has not moved an inch towards a feasible policy that would prevent something like that from happening again. Basically, we're entirely dependent on the deal with Mr. Erdogan who uh, grew tired of asking for money and then just started busing migrants to the border with Greece. And, um, and then you, you know, that was his way of warning the Europeans that they need to step up to the plate. So obviously all the cards are in his hands. And, um, and I think obviously we'll see this escalate again in the future. Now, obviously Turkey is also busy dealing with the pandemic. So they won't be busing migrants to the border anytime soon. But uh, this is this is just another dormant crisis. Not that dormant, but it's still sort of on hold, this pause. And how we'll deal with that, I mean, it's difficult to say. And, you know, the Europe has a way of just sort of muddling through, as I said. And I think that's the modus operandi. And there's a sort of a, a bit of a fat, fatalism in Germany about that because they, you know, they they deal with the issue at hand. And, and Ms. Merkel's, so far successful strategy has been to sit out problems you know she's not a huge problem solver she is a person who can manage a crisis because she's calm and thoughtful and she builds alliances and she's good at negotiating and, and sort of uh, 
eternal processes, but she's not good at sort of, you know, what Ms. Mac Mr. Macron is trying to do, which is which is basically to cut through and and, and arrive at, at a sort of a forceful solution. He has been trying that anyway. We'll see at, at what rate of success. So I think, yeah, it's not to be expected that we'll we'll get too far in terms of strategizing about about the multiple crises. And, uh, and as for the rise of populism, I think once the pandemic is over, the economic crisis will be human humongous. I mean, this will be unlike anything we've seen in living memory. And of course, countries like Italy will be at the forefront of, of, of this populist sort of upheaval. And I think even now polls are showing that Italians are, are really angry with their own government, with, with their own economy, with the European response. And the Eurozone as such, obviously is a huge issue it's not fit for purpose and the call for euro bonds will continue euro bonds is a way of sort of guaranteeing death for everyone which would in the views of proponents help the eurozone become sustainable because i think most economists think eurozone which is the heart of the european union is not necessarily sustainable in the long run now germany whether germany will ever be able to accept guaranteeing the death of countries like italy uh, systemically and in the long run remains to be seen. I don't think it's, it's, it's impossible, although it does seem impossible now, because once the Greens enter government, which is probable, I think they, are, they stand for, uh, you know, more Europe and et cetera. So we, we might even see, you know, in, in, the, in, in the depth of the next, next crisis, Germany doing a U-turn on its orthodoxy, like it did a U-turn now on its fiscal orthodoxy and, and sort of allowing for a common guarantee but it's too early to say. I think, I think it's impossible to predict many things because the economic impact of this will be unprecedented. And of, of course, the political response must be unprecedented as well. I think that's absolutely right. And that's a really good point for us to, uh, to end on. So as ever, we find that you to be uh, perhaps more resilient than expected, but also as ever, the wolves are also still at the door. So. Thank you so much, Boyan. That's been incredibly helpful, and I'm, I'm incredibly impressed by your uh, very deft uh, handling of, of my excessively compound questions there as well. Um, the situation in, in Germany will remain of huge interest and fascination to us uh, in the UK and also to our um, networks over in uh, DC as well, I'm sure. So hopefully we can check in uh, later in the crisis as things evolve again. But uh, for now, just to say thank you very much. My pleasure.